The second uh, Neufeld lecture will be delivered by uh, Dr. Elliot Antman. Dr. Altman, Antman is a professor of medicine, associate dean of clinical and translational research at Harvard Medical School, and a senior physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He is the senior investigator in the Timmy study group and was the lead investigator in many trials that were conducted also in Israel. Dr. Antman was the chairman of the joint ACC AHA task force on practice guideline and has chaired or been a member of several guideline committees. He is the president-elect of the American Heart Association and we are excited for the opportunity to start uh, this new collaboration with the American Heart Association. It is my great honor uh, to invite Dr. Antman to deliver this lecture, Clinical Research and the Development of Medical Therapeutics. Please, Dr. Antman. So, uh, Tudara Ba Adoni, Shalom Alechem Hevri. Peace among you, my friends. <laughs> Dr. O'Gar, you can add that to your repertoire now. <laughs> My distinguished uh, colleagues, of course, from Israel and from the ESC uh, and from the ACC. Uh, it is a, a distinct honor for me to deliver uh, this uh, second Henry Neufeld uh, lecture in uh, thinking about Dr. Neufeld, and it is with some degree of poignancy that I found these words from Shlomo Stern, whose picture we just saw. And he wrote regarding Henry Neufeld that in crisscrossing the globe with all his international duties and tasks, everywhere he went, he left behind him people full of admiration who were proud to announce, Henry Neufeld is my friend. And I feel very privileged to have been able to consider Henry Neufeld my friend as well. We shared patients who spent part of the time in Boston, part of the time uh, here in Israel. And in fact, it is my recollections of uh, Professor Neufeld that have given me inspiration to prepare my remarks today on clinical research and the development of medical therapeutics. I'm sure a topic that he and Dr. Stern would have been so deeply involved in if we had the opportunity to have them at our side. So let us uh, look first at the disclosures here. I am uh, an investigator in the Timmy study group. Shown in yellow are those sponsors who sponsored trials where I was the principal investigator. I'd ask you to consider the range of clinical research. We can observe our subject. We can measure something about our subject that reflects their physiologic state. Or we can intervene to change their medical condition. Now, we can do all of that across the biologic continuum. When our patients are in ideal health, they have developed risk factors and have made that transition to the development of overt disease. We refer to our prevention efforts as primordial when we focus on health behavior so as to maintain a state of ideal health. We call it primary prevention when we attempt to reduce risk in individuals who have developed risk factors and secondary prevention, of course, when we try and prevent the second or future recurrences after clinical disease has occurred. But of particular interest to us is the treatment of the active disease when our patient presents uh, to us with that. There are a range of technologies. We've actually heard about many of these this morning. I've organized the technologies that we have as cardiovascular specialists into five buckets. Drug, device, biologics, a biomarker assay, and imaging procedures. Those are the five bins from which we draw our therapies or our diagnostic tools, and that's the technology that we work with. Uh, there are some common features as we evaluate each of these technologies, such as the ethics of human research and many of the regulatory considerations. But each of them also has individual uh, regulatory and research requirements uh, to bring a new technology forward. Today I'm going to focus on drugs and we're going to examine how uh, a standard of care came to our hands and how a new treatment has been delivered uh, into our hands and where we are today. And I will discuss that in the context of a very common condition. And I refer to it as a condition rather than an arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation. 
which is really a disease state that uh, is a global problem, estimated to affect 33.5 million individuals around the world. And as you know, it is a particular problem in the elderly where there is a higher uh, prevalence of atrial fibrillation. And with the improvements in our therapies, you saw some of them in the charts that were presented earlier, uh, we are going to be seeing more and more elderly patients in our population. And it is projected that the problem of atrial fibrillation will become an increasingly more important one for us to deal with. This is a real challenge for us because, as you know, it is associated with a very high cost to our health care system, among uh, one of the, the highest costs when you consider all the longitudinal care that is required for patients, unfortunately, if they've developed the most feared complication of atrial fibrillation, which is a, a stroke. Uh, we have evidence that anticoagulant therapy is effective in reducing the risk of stroke. And as you know, the most common uh, treatment that we've offered for over half a century uh, was warfarin. Uh, but there are some problems with that. So let's examine how we received warfarin. Perhaps some of you are not aware of this story. In the 1920s in the United States, in the upper Midwest and in some portions of Canada, farmers were reporting a very serious problem in their cattle. After feeding them certain batches of hay, after a few weeks, the cattle would develop a bleeding problem which was almost always fatal. It was known at the time that epidemiologic observations, mostly by veterinarians, were, uh, that there was something to do with the hay, which is shown here as the sweet clover hay, so-called because it smells sweet when it's mowed. And what was known at the time was that a natural substance was found in the shaft of that sweet clover hay. It's a benzopyrone, and it is coumarin. And in 1933, a farmer in Wisconsin became very upset because now, in the winter, the bull in his herd was bleeding from the nose. And that was a disaster because he would not be able to populate his herd, and that was his livelihood. So he drove to Madison, Wisconsin, and found himself in the laboratory of Dr. Paul Link, who is pictured here, and presented to Dr. Link 100 pounds of sweet clover hay. And he also brought in a milk can the blood he had collected, actually, from one of the other cattle that had been bleeding. And in the three hours it took him to drive, in a blinding snowstorm from his farm to Madison, Wisconsin, that blood did not clot in that milk can. So the lab set a, uh, about to try and figure out what was going on, and it took them six years uh, to identify the fact that this was the hemorrhagic agent, the causative agent, and they discovered by examining under, an electron micro under a dissecting microscope crystals that had been seen on the shaft of that sweet clover hay that didn't belong there. To make a long story short, they discovered that a fermentation reaction had occurred when the hay got wet, and two of the coumarin molecules were fused together. And this was an agent that was causing the hemorrhagic problem in the cattle, and they called this dicoumarol. Now, in a biochemistry laboratory, people like to make derivatives of things they have discovered. So this laboratory set about to make derivatives of dicoumarol. It turns out that derivative number 42 was much more potent than dicoumarol at producing the hemorrhagic problem in the cattle, and it occurred much more rapidly. So they had a new agent, which was not found in nature. And they decided to name this agent after the sponsor of the laboratory, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, and recognizing that it was an original derivative of coumarin, and they introduced into the medical literature warfarin, uh, which of course originally began as a rodenticide, a rat poison, uh, and then became a, a drug that was tested in various states where it was important to provide anticoagulant therapy. So this chart shows us the six randomized controlled trials that basically put warfarin on the map as our standard of care for preventing stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. 
These trials were conducted between 1989 and 1993. And please note that in aggregate, these six trials enrolled 2,900 subjects. And it is remarkable when we compare that to the sample size of the trials that we're dealing with today. But of course, warfarin was being compared with control therapy, which is essentially placebo here. And this meta-analysis showed the very dramatic and highly statistically significant 64% reduction in total stroke, and importantly, a 67% reduction in uh, ischemic stroke. Warfarin became our standard of care. But as we know, there are problems with it, and we discover more and more about the difficulties uh, with warfarin in implementing it as an anticoagulant in clinical practice. And here are two recent papers that I came across in preparing my remarks today. On the left is a report from a clinical practice research uh, database uh, in the United Kingdom. It's a case control study looking at over 70,000 subjects with atrial fibrillation who received uh, warfarin. And here's a very interesting plot, which is a cubic smoothed spline, which basically says, hmm, during the first week, there appears to be an increase in the risk of stroke as individuals are started on warfarin. This is in a very large database. We haven't been able to confirm this in clinical trials yet, uh, but we have to do some more analyses in that. But it does suggest to me that during the very first week or two, when we have not yet achieved a therapeutic INR, our individuals, when viewed as a population, are at increased risk. And we have to think about that as we consider antithrombotic therapy. And even if we get past that initial period, maintenance with warfarin is an issue. We grade our clinical trials based upon the time and therapeutic range, and we're delighted when we see TTRs in the 60 to 65 percent range. But here is a report from the Quest Diagnostics database. Quest Diagnostics is a laboratory that supports about 50 percent of the medical practices in the United States for INR measurement. And uh, only about 50 percent of individuals actually have their INR in the uh, target range of two to three. That's 138,000 individuals and 2.7 million INR measurements that are aggregated here. So there's a problem, uh, and the search was on for replacements for warfarin. And that's how we got to the new or novel oral anticoagulants. And here's a schematic diagram of the coagulation system showing you the extrinsic limb on the left and the intrinsic limb on the right meeting at the final common pathway where factor 10A and factor 5 uh, assemble on a phospholipid membrane uh, and then go on to ultimately activate uh, prothrombin to thrombin and form fibrin. Here are the four agents that have been studied, dabigatran, a 2A inhibitor, and the three anti-10A inhibitors, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and idoxaban. And I would like you to reflect on the fact that to get to these four agents, which we are discussing in phase three clinical trials, and many of which are now available to us for, to prescribe, took on average 15 years of research and development and about $1 billion each of those four agents. So I would argue that we actually have to think differently about this. Here's what we know so far based upon a meta-analysis which we conducted just uh, coincident with our report of the Engage AF Timmy 48 study at the uh, AHA meeting in uh, November. We know that with respect to uh, ischemic stroke, our new oral anticoagulants, now looking at about 72,000 patients' worth of data, are similar to warfarin for prevention of ischemic stroke. But the very dramatic observation was that there's a 50 percent reduction in hemorrhagic stroke, which, of course, is one of the things that gives us pause as we reach for our prescription pad or our keyboard now uh, to prescribe warfarin. Now, with respect to warfarin's clinical use relative to the new oral agents, what do the new agents offer? There's no laboratory monitoring that is required. Pharmacogenetics, still an issue for warfarin, are not needed for the new oral anticoagulants, but compliance is very important. 
they have a short half-life, so that missing one or two doses of a new oral anticoagulant is far more significant to the patient with respect to their risk than missing one or two doses of warfarin because its effect on the coagulation factors lasts much longer. No antidote is available specifically for the new oral agents, but uh, several are under development. Also consider how we receive these oral anticoagulants for atrial fibrillation. Warfarin was discovered, I would argue, by play of chance, serendipity. It was just play of chance that that farmer showed up in the laboratory of an agricultural biochemist who had the capacity to make the discoveries that I outlined for you. And I also showed you that warfarin was largely compared to placebo, which meant that its developmental costs were low because the sample size of the trials were relatively small. Now, we, we recognize the tremendous advances of uh, molecular biology and medicinal chemistry that gave us the very targeted new oral anticoagulants, but because warfarin was the standard of care, they had to be compared to an active comparator, very large trials, very expensive in terms of development. We cannot rely on either of these for the therapeutics that we need. I agree with Dr. Vargas that we need innovation here. We cannot rely on play of chance to bring us the next medical treatment that we wish to offer our patients, nor can we afford the non-sustainable uh, pathway uh, that the new oral anticoagulants represent. So we need to talk about innovation in drug development and think about the scientific advances some of which we've heard today, Dr. Vargas said, that's where we need to be focusing our energy as cardiovascular uh, specialists in the future. I wholeheartedly agree, agree, and I put these into two categories. The innovations that I would like to uh, bring to your attention fall into a systems-based approach, use of iPS cells and organs on a chip. I'll explain all of that in just a moment. And in addition, when we get into the clinical investigation end, we need to be thinking more about adaptive designs in our clinical trials. We need to think about new research platforms and make better use of the new tools and technologies that are available to us as we consider this developmental pathway, which is the one that takes now 15 years and costs $1 billion, originally screening 10,000 compounds for one that makes it to regulatory approval. This is the population approach we currently take to discovering therapeutics in classical clinical trials. We enroll a cohort of patients that we hope is representative of the population that has the disease state that we are studying. We report the results of our trial as the average result observed in that population. We report the statistical significance of that observation. On occasion, we delve into some subgroup analyses. Almost always, these are underpowered and really are viewed as hypothesis generating, but they are of always great interest to us. The subgroups, men versus women, the elderly, the young. Rarely, if ever, do we actually get down to the individual patient. So a systems approach turns this around and makes use of the genomic, molecular, cellular, and whole organ observations in an individual patient and the network of information that we have for that individual patient. So here, we are starting now with a molecularly defined individual. Building from that, we see other individuals who have a similar profile. That's our subgroup. And then we think more of the population, and now we see the richness of our population with the individual sets of molecular profiles that are present in our population. Let me give you a simple example that illustrates how this might work. Here's a drug. Doesn't matter, but it's one dose that we give to everybody in the population. Let's say it's 100 milligrams. But if instead of just picking that one dose, we actually looked at the genotype of the individuals in the population and discovered that some individuals had functional alleles, some had reduced functional alleles, 
and some had non-functional alleles for metabolism of that drug. That would translate into phenotypes that we might call ultra-rapid metabolizers, extensive metabolizers, intermediate metabolizers, and poor metabolizers. That would mean that instead of 100 milligrams, the ultra-rapid metabolizers would get 500 milligrams. The extensive and intermediate metabolizers would get 100 milligrams, and the poor metabolizers would get 10 milligrams, a much more targeted approach that hopefully will be associated with better efficacy and even more importantly, much better safety. To do this kind of developmental work and these clinical trials means we need to partner with our uh, regulatory authorities to think about how we would present the data uh, along these lines. And there are, uh, there are encouraging signs that regulatory authorities are actually already uh, taking uh, stock of this particular approach. Human IPS cells are very important for drug discovery. In 2007, Shinya Yamanaka and his colleagues reported that they could take a human skin fibroblast and treat it with various reprogramming factors and convert those human fibro, skin fibroblasts into inducible pluripotent stem cells, human IPS stem cells, which then could be stimulated to differentiate into various other types of cells as IPS cells are capable of doing. And in this photograph from their seminal 2007 paper in Cell, you see human IPS cell-derived cardiomyocytes. And what would we do with that? Now look at the diagram on the right. We see an individual at the bottom at the 6 o'clock position. That individual has a phenotypically defined disease state. You pick your disease state of interest and you know a lot about that patient. Take that patient's skin fibroblast, reprogram it to become an IPS cell, differentiate that into cardiomyocytes, and now put them in a dish. And you have a platform where there are human IPS cell-derived cardiomyocytes from a phenotypically defined patient. Imagine exposing that culture of cells to various drugs so that a much more targeted therapy could be developed. Here is one of the most fascinating things I've seen in a very long time. It happens to come from our colleagues at the Wies Institute uh, at Harvard, where they're doing novel bioengineering approaches. You see uh, at the top left neonatal rat cardiomyocytes, which are placed on a deformable, thin, elastic film. That red monolayer has been placed onto that deformable film, into which have been cut very carefully designed, laser-guided uh, cuts so that there are strips. You can see those strips in the center diagram. When the cells contract, they are cardiomyocytes, when they contract, the film deforms. And you actually see the flaps in the bottom diagram actually shifting upward. So read the center diagram as end diastole and the bottom left diagram as end systole. Now you take this little organ on a chip, put it in a microfluid test chamber into which you can now infuse drugs in different concentrations and apply electrical stimuli to actually have those cardiomyocytes contract. And as a proof-of-concept experiment, these investigators at the Wies Institute showed us the dose-response curve for isoproteranol at the bottom right with respect to percent change in twitch stress. Fascinating little platform here. Let your mind wander for a moment and imagine the next set of experiments. What if they took human IPS cell-derived cardiomyocytes from a phenotypically defined patient, and that's what was put on that deformable film. What if they did the 3D mapping that we heard about earlier and took this two-dimensional platform and actually made a three-dimensional platform which would mimic the human heart? Then we would be on our way to actually defining drugs that might have a much better chance of being successful in future clinical trials, still the Achilles heel for much of our developmental work. Now, we as clinical trialists also need to think about adaptive designs. What do I mean by that? In black on the left is shown the basic structure of a clinical trial. We find our individuals who fulfill our enrollment criteria 
we randomized them into treatment A and treatment B, and we followed them for the primary endpoint. When we talk about an adaptive design, there are three basic features to it. We inspect the data while the trial is ongoing. Now, that may seem shocking when we think about this in a frequentist approach, where we say start the trial, don't look, and just keep going until you have the proper number of endpoints. But the adaptive design says actually inspect the data, modify the study purposefully in response to the evolving data, and allow the study to continue. There are three levels where we can uh, perform these trial adaptations. We could modify the enrollment criteria. A particular interest might be modification of the treatment arms or adjustments of the endpoints and analyses. Again, let's look at a very simple example of this. Consider a phase two dose ranging trial, which our clinical pharmacologists would call the learning phase. And here there are four uh, different doses of a test agent that are being compared to control. In an adaptive design approach, various interim analyses would be pre-specified, and at each interim analysis, a decision is made about whether or not one of those doses is still a viable candidate. It may turn out that at one or two of the interim analyses, it becomes clear that one or more of these doses would actually not be an attractive candidate to take forward. And in this simple example, after a series of these interim analyses, you'd get to the second of the doses in this four-level uh, dose-ranging trial and select that one to move forward in a seamless fashion for a phase three confirmatory registration pathway trial. This approach would allow us to actually approach those phase three trials armed with much better information about dose ranging, another major Achilles heel as we enter our current uh, phase three trials today. Now let's turn our attention to some new technologies that could enable clinical research. Many people have a wearable sensor, a Fitbit or one of those watches that will enable you to see how many steps you've walked, how many calories you've burned. These wearable sensors communicate by Bluetooth to your smartphone, which it turns out 75% of us have within five feet of us 24 hours a day. Right, Shall You have yours? <laughs> now, once it's on your smartphone, it can go in a wireless transmission fashion anywhere in the world to a research-grade database on the Internet. This allows us to now start seriously talking about big data. What can we do with all this? Now let's return to the range of clinical research that I started with and the biologic continuum on the bottom and actually consider a population of individuals in whom we might wish to make some observations, some measurements, and perform some interventions and actually do it across the spectrum of ideal health risk factors and overt disease. Is this even possible right now? Well, yes, it is. Our colleagues at the University of California in San Francisco have launched something called the Healthy Heart Study. This is a study that is leveraging the power of the internet and mobile technology to enroll a target of one million subjects around the world. It has the easiest enrollment criteria that I've ever seen for a clinical trial. You have to be over age 18 and you have access to the internet. Just think about that with respect to some of the clinical trial enrollment criteria that you've seen in the past. Individuals who sign the electronic consent form on the website will send uh, their information uh, to the, uh, the database by filling out electronic visits, shown at the top right there, uh, where their basic information is uh, loaded. And if they say, yes, you can have my sensor data as well, then in real time, their physiologic measurements are actually loaded into their research account as well. Shortly, biospecimen data will be able to be loaded onto this platform. The software code is being written now so the uh, API for the interface to capture data from the electronic medical record is being written. The American Heart Association actually has formed a scientific collaboration with the Healthy Heart Study and we are referring participants in our patient networks to this study and shortly we'll be receiving data back from the study which will be very useful to us for guiding how well we are doing to our mission and our 2020 impact goal of reducing morbidity and mortality from 
heart diseases and stroke by 20% by 2020. We should also think much more seriously about embedding clinical research in clinical care. Every day, we are sitting in our office and we have in our hands the blue pill or the red pill, and we don't know which one is really better for our patient. But we have one of the most powerful research tools right in front of us. It's the electronic medical record. What if we could push the red button and actually randomize individuals at the point of care and use the electronic me medical record as the case report form of the future? This would be a very powerful technology for us, uh, and it is something that we really need to move towards. Now, if we were to achieve this vision, there are several things that we will accomplish, and I'm going to show you that in the last three slides. The first is, our thinking about what works and how we should write our guidelines, I believe, would be radically transformed. So at the top is shown the, trans, the continuum from ideal health to risk factors and clinical disease. Right now, we say our highest level of evidence are the randomized controlled trials. So when we talk about randomized trials, let's think about the large buckets into which they might fall. In this JAMA viewpoint that I wrote with the current AHA president, Dr. Mariel Jessup, we, we indicate randomized clinical trial category A is largely enrolling individuals in ideal health, largely non-informative, very few endpoints, and these individuals are not going to show us whether or not the treatment is going to work. And in, also, this trial has a relatively short follow-up, this set of trials. Category B would be individuals who have risk factors and that's not bad, and we're following them for a little bit longer, but when you think about the time horizon of the continuum for hypertension and hypercholesterolemia with respect to causing atherosclerosis, even the longest of the type B trials is far too short. And we simply don't have uh, enough opportunity to sample the biologic continuum. When we enroll people who have overt clinical disease, as Dr. Bahanian pointed out, we're probably too late to actually test things. And yes, we return to our epidemiologic observations across that biologic continuum, but the concern that is always raised is the issue of bias or confounding, making our observations a little bit uncertain. Now, what if we actually were to randomize individuals in a free-living cohort, like that healthy heart study that I just showed you? Now we've got individuals along the biologic continuum, and we randomize them and follow them for a long enough period of time. That healthy heart study is destined to go for 10 years. That's what it's scheduled to do. And we are about to launch our first randomization within the Healthy Heart Study to attempt to uh, improve uh, behaviors towards uh, cardiovascular heart healthy living and see which of the various behavior modifications might be the best to approach uh, a particular patient with. So I offer this as a, a opportunity for us to use some of these new technologies and actually change the way we think about acquiring evidence and actually uh, formulating our recommendations. We are at a moment in time as cardiovascular specialists that we have never had before us. Consider the convergence, in fact, the super convergence of the advances in biotechnology, the advances in sensor technology, and how we might use that to actually improve behavior the advances in information technology in the fullest extent of that term and mobile health. For the very first time, we have in the hands of research scientists and healthcare professionals these new tools, and it is our responsibility to use them correctly and actually to appropriately guide our individuals in the social networks of patients and consumers so they get credible information from us as healthcare professionals instead of coming in with a 10-inch printout from the internet and arrive in your office. Now finally, if we took steps in this direction, and I am confident that the creativity and ingenuity that was cited earlier uh, by Dr. O'Gara for our Israeli colleagues is going to contribute to this. Imagine that if we took the advances in clinical medicine and the advances in biomedical research and actually fed this into an integrated information commons, which was then part of an ultimate knowledge network we would be a step closer to what's called precision medicine by the Institute of Medicine in the United States. 
In fact, doing so might lead to new taxonomic classifications of disease. We wouldn't just call someone as a patient with atrial fibrillation. We would say they have atrial fibrillation with the following particular molecular profile or clinical characteristics. That might lead to some novel clinical approaches and certainly would be the resource for basic research in the future. Imagine the benefits of a future world that we would have if we were to really engage in this learning system which is continuously updated so that we truly could take appropriate uh, use of the advances that are happening all around us. Todaraba, Lehitraud. <laughs> <laughs>